All right. So, probably everyone in here who's done any Rails work, which is most everyone in here, has used Active Record or exclusively used Active Record as, a, as an ORM with Rails. Um, recently, at uh, my previous employer, um, I needed to rewrite a legacy Rails application, believe it or not, which doesn't happen very often. It was Rails 1.1.6, hadn't been touched more or less like since it was deployed. Like people had gotten in and kind of like thrown some code at it, which was by code I mean mostly SQL, like straight SQL. In fact, the whole app was mostly SQL. It wasn't really Rails. It was SQL stuffed into the Rails framework. Anyway, that, uh, that's a whole other thing. So uh, it needed to interact with um, a legacy database. A legacy database might be a little bit unfair for this particular database. The database was structured the way it was structured for very particular reasons, uh, and I'm sure very good reasons, and they had a DBA on staff and all that good stuff. But as far as I'm concerned, it's legacy. Why? Because it doesn't work the way Rails wants it to work. So that's legacy. That's, that's our new definition for purposes of this presentation. So I decided to use Data Mapper. Data Mapper makes it very easy to work with uh, databases that Active Record doesn't find all that awesome, basically. So, seven and a half reasons to use Data Mapper, or, like I said, how to use Rails with legacy databases. Number one, everybody probably knows this about Data Mapper if you've heard of Data Mapper at all. You can define the properties right in the model. Um, so, I really like this. Some people don't like it. Uh, you know, it has the potential, depending on how many fields you have, to make your model kind of really big as far as the actual lines of code go. Um, I'll, I'll get to a, a way that that can be not so bad, uh, depending on, on your needs a little bit later. But So right there, so you can hopefully everybody can see, uh, that's how you define your properties or your, your fields, right in your model. Um, can and they pull have, the projector back so maybe it's bigger? I don't know if that works. Okay. That, that help? Yeah, some. Yeah, thanks. Uh, it says property and then field name. Maybe okay. the dark blue is not helpful. Yeah, it's gonna... Sorry. Right. There's going to be a lot more of that, too. I'm really okay. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. So that's, that's awesome. But everybody pretty much knows about that one. So it's really probably not that exciting for you. Um, another thing. Can you zoom in on that? No. This one. So actually, I, I, now I know I didn't need to do this. These are all blurred out. So these mean nothing. But this is a piece of a schema that I've had to deal with. These are, this is, this is part of one table. Like it actually got cut off uh, because I couldn't fit it on my one, screen. One table? One, yes. That is, that's, that's one table and that's not all of one table. How many columns? I didn't count. A lot. How many tables, generally? Uh, in this app? In, yeah, in, like that app. Um, I don't remember. There, Generally, was, there weren't a whole lot in the, the data mapper app I wrote anyway. And th this is this is an extreme case for sure. But if you've ever had to deal with anything like this, um, or just a database that looked like this, where maybe you only cared about say seven of the fields, which I had to deal with in the uh, the app at Cha Cha, um, you can selectively you can choose which fields you actually define in your model. So you don't have your your app doesn't have to if your app doesn't have to be aware of all of them, then your app doesn't have to be aware of all. Of them. So you can choose, well, I, only, I really only need these three you know, fields from this table that has 18 you know, different fields or whatever, and that's fine. And Data Mapper's not going to scream because it doesn't know about these other ones. It doesn't care. It only cares about the ones you tell it to care about. So I think that's really awesome. Auto validations, which is actually kind of a crappy term, I think, for it, but it fit really well on the screen. Um, Basically, when you're defining your properties, uh, right on that property, you know, like property, field name, string, and then unique uh, hash rocket true. So that automatically creates a validation so that that field's always going to be unique. Or you can say require hash rocket true, or you know, length zero to 32 characters or whatever. And you define all, you can define all of those right on your property, which I think is really nice. Uh, it reads to me a little bit nicer than um, the validates presence of, but you can also do those if you prefer the active record style validations. Those are also available in Data Mapper. 
So I, I really like these, and you might not be able to see it very well, but they also have some predefined regexes and stuff like uh, you can say format email address or format URL, or you can throw in your own regex, and those will also do auto validations. So now this was awesome uh, in the app I did at ChaCha. You, when you define a property on your model, um, you can call it whatever you want and then tell in that same uh, property call, tell it that the actual field name is something horrendous that some DBA thought was a good idea. So, um, for instance, the, the examples here are uh, property ID and the field is PID, which that's not so bad, but uh, this, is, this is pretty awesome if you have to deal with um, someone who thought it was fun to prefix all of their column names with the type that that column is. So if you have a lot of like int uh, something fields and you know str name and stuff like that, you can get around that by uh, aliasing essentially or you know, calling your field whatever you want to and then telling it what its real name is and it'll figure it out from there. Uh, so I'm kind of cheating here, four and a, because I said seven and a half, right? So four and a half is you can do that same thing, but you can set data mapper up to just do that app, app wide or site wide. So let's say every single table is prefixed with TBL, so like TBL users, uh, you know, TBL content, TBL whatever, which is, is semi-common, I guess. Not awesome, but semi-common. And maybe every column is prefixed with, you know, whatever. Stupid field name, whatever. So you can set that up uh, in the data mapper config so it just knows that um, app-wide, and then you don't have to open up every model and put, uh, for instance, you can alias your table with, you know, uh, storage name is this. You don't have to do that in every model if you want to set it up site-wide if they're all the same all over the place. So that's pretty awesome. So again, it makes the, the actual API that you're working with, the interface that you're working with, uh, a lot more sane if you have to deal with a, a crappy database. So this was also awesome uh, in the app that I worked on at ChaCha. So they wanted, not only were there two different databases that I needed to connect to, um, two different actual different databases, different tables and stuff, which, by the way, also had a relation to each other, which was whatever. So there was that. Um, but they also, once, once it went into production, they wanted there to be uh, a database that you wrote to, a database that you read from, and then also the secondary database. So Data Mapper makes it really easy, and in particular, in particular the uh, DM-Rails gem makes it really easy to set up in your uh, database.yaml a way to uh, list the different databases that you're going to be connected to. They call them repositories, so I don't, I don't know how well you can see this, but um, in, for instance, in development here, I am declaring a database, which is essentially the default database, and then you can mention other repositories in the YAML. Um, and I have one called secondary and one called writer. So then, and I should have shown this, but later in the code, and it's just a detail really, you can uh, specifically call upon the writer repository and call or uh, pass it a block that executes the code within that block only on the writer database. Um, so this can be good for performance reasons, obviously. Um, you know, if you have a read slave, which is what, what they had at ChaCha, that uh, they could optimize all, all reads on that and not worry about bringing down their primary write database. And so it, that's another awesome thing. I'm really glad I chose Data Mapper when we got to the end and they told me that I had to do this since they waited till the end to tell me that. <laughs> uh, and this is... Uh, a really cool thing I haven't actually taken advantage of, but um, I thought it should be mentioned. There are a ton of plugins or gems or whatever to make Data Mapper work with various data stores. And sure, it works with MySQL and uh, PostgreSQL and all of the RDBMSs pretty much, but it also works with, so you have the same API that you would with, with MySQL. You have the same API with, say, uh, RIAC or Redis or what have you and stuff like that. But they also, there are also adapters for uh, Facebook, so you could query 
Facebook API with FQL or whatever. Um, there's a Google Data API. There's a ton of other stuff. There's uh, um, Google Google's uh, App Engine data store. Um, what about the uh, Yahoo the Yahoo query language like you um, Probably, I don't remember specifically. There is a GitHub Wiki page that has most of them listed, but then it doesn't. It hasn't gathered all of them, so you could probably do a search on, on GitHub and find a great deal of them. Um, but I was actually really impressed um, and slightly weirded out by some of the things that they chose to make an adapter for, honestly. Uh, so, seven. <coughs> this is the one that I think, and I, maybe I shouldn't have saved it for last night, I should have thrown it in the middle so it wasn't the lasting impression, but this one is kind of weird for some people, um, especially now that uh, Active Records, ARL, or whatever, the, the Active Relations stuff is out, because it is a little bit cleaner, but maybe I think ARL doesn't quite take it as far as Data Mapper took it from basically the very beginning. So I don't know if you can see this, but you can do things like uh, instead of passing a conditions array or conditions hash to the, the find method on your model, uh, for one thing, you can just pass it um, a hash with like name, hash rocket, miles, and that will just go find all the records. Uh, that have the name miles. Well, you can also say, um, say you want to find all products with a price greater than uh, greater than five dollars. You can pass the hash price dot gt for greater than hash rocket five dollars. So some people don't like that because it looks funny. Uh, it's kind of weird. It doesn't. It's, not, it's certainly not as pretty as you might be used to a lot of uh, Ruby gems being, but it is kind of awesome how easily you can write uh, what you might normally have to step down into SQL for. Um, so the example here is runtime.gt hash rocket 2 or runtime.lt hash rocket 5. So runtime greater than 2 or less than 5 basically. Um, there's also an equals and a like and uh, greater than or equal to and less than or equal to or GTE or LTE and a not. So the comma just it just assumes that's an or between the two uh, parameters in your uh, it turned it into an and. So okay. I assume it's semi intelligent and figures out what it should be. I guess I don't know for sure actually. So anyway, those are my seven and a half reasons I think you should try Data Mapper. Any questions? Yeah. Um, um, do you ever, I mean, it might be far fetched, but you ever see it as like an active record replacement? Like a lot of this stuff in here, I use Mongoid, um, it's a Rails 3 version, like that, it's not a query language, but um, you see it as an active record replacement, like if you want to use several different, if you have a department use several different backends, just to make your stack a little lighter. Um, was it just not that functional? I, I think it would definitely work as an active record replacement. Um, I mean, I, I guess in, in, in essentially, although not not at that not that way, you use several different backends, but it's essentially what I did in the app at okay. Shot John. It worked out yeah. really well. I think it's I think it's more powerful and more flexible than Active Record, but Active Record has been there since the start, <clears> and it's hard to get past if. If you just follow the conventions, if you're starting a new app and you follow the conventions of what works well with Active Record, it's so simple to just have it automatically, you know, create all the methods for you, you know, if you have five tables. Um, whereas with this, you know, there's for new people, there's going to be a little bit more setup. Mm -hmm. I'm kind of control free. So. Yeah. <laughs> um, I forget what I was going to say. Eric. That, 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 was, that discussion was kind of what I was going to ask is would you consider using it for green fields project uh, instead of using active record? Um, I, I would say yes because I think it's a perfectly valid choice. I haven't done that though, so it's hard to defend that <coughs> response. Um, the, there were, uh, David did work on me with me on this project. He didn't work on me. It's kind of weird. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, 
actually sat on my lap. <laughs> <laughs> That's how we pair program. I don't know how other people do it. That's not weird, right? No. <laughs> don't judge. Uh, it's kind of like the walking chair. <laughs> <laughs> We, we did find that there are, the one downside is that there are a number of gems that just assume active record, of course. Um, luckily, Divides does not 100% assume active record. There's some, um, there's some trickery we had to do. Actually, we only had to do weird things because that database was retarded. Yeah. It wasn't that retarded. It was fine. It was retarded. <laughs> question. Yeah. I wasn't paying attention, but do you subclass, <laughs> you subclass data mapper? No, for your models you include you all the slides. That's nice too. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> On the lines of stack part group replacement and that comma, what is it? Can you do a straight query, like a string query? Like the simple SQL? Like a SQL thing? Yeah, so I don't have to assume that's an and or an or. I can just tell it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you can do the. You can do a lot of data mapper. Data mapper includes a lot of the, the active record way of doing things as well, because it knows they know that it's almost, in my opinion, it's almost a marketing thing. They know that if you can do things like you would an active record as much as possible, then you're more likely to use data mapper. And then if data mapper gets more people using it, then it gets further improved, and the people who prefer data mapper are happy. But a lot, most of what you would do in uh, Active record you can do in data mapper. There are some small syntax or API differences. Instead of uh, instead of update attributes, which I actually love this, you just call update. Um, if I remember correctly, instead of calling find, you typically call get. If you're just finding an ID, just trying to get an ID, find actually might be defined as well, though I can't recall as an alias. Um, so, but there's little things like that. But mo most of most of what you would be comfortable doing in Active Record, you can also do in Data Mapper. Yes. Good question: How does um, performance and scalability compare to Back? Um, so, I knew I was going to get asked that question. <laughs> so, I will tell you, I can't really answer it okay. because I, I, the the highest number of concurrent users we could possibly have on the app, well, that I, that I think they they've had is maybe 200 at a time. So it hasn't really, and it's on a, like a, it's on a ridiculously large machine with like 32 gigs of RAM. I think uh, something like say 800,000 CPUs or something, I don't really know about, I don't know anything about hardware. Um, so it hasn't run into any issues. So there's that, it hasn't run into any issues. So I guess that's a plus. But other than that, I can't say for sure. It's got a success rate of 100%. Yes, exactly, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> so what was the justification for the read-write, for the um, read slave if there's only 200 concurrent users? So there is a particular, well, partially just because they're particular, but there actually is a particular view um, that that is rough on the database, and it also happens to be the view that users want to see the most often. It's pretty much the, honestly, this view is the only reason that this app even exists. So, um, and this, this database, the, the primary write database is used by several other uh, things at ChaCha. So it, it, it's, it's a large machine that just takes in all the writes basically and there's a, a, uh, a, a great deal of satellite slave databases essentially like and actually, there's pretty much a slave database for every app, a slave read for every app that they have. So, um, to an extent, it was a probably a DBA requested thing, but it's it's sort of a future proofing thing, I guess. A pre uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Early term I'm looking for. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Anything else? No. Good. All right.